Nikola Jokic is the best player in the world right now. He's just a tough cover. We we tried everything. But he's just naturally, like, amazing. You know Jokic don't have Instagram or nothing. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite players to watch is Jokic. And when I first seen him, I'm like, bro, it don't even feel real. Whatever is needed on a possession, he's just going to make the right play. He had this rep of being like a bad defender, but he's not. He's not just making it. It's not becoming just an all-star. It's not just winning a championship. It's it's like being one of the best players in the league. His ethos, his spirit sort of permeates the roster. He's like, I didn't even aim. I just threw it up in the air. <laughs> Apparently, stat padding gets you a long way in the NBA. Gets you all the way to the championship. The big takeaway for me was just Jokic and how good he is. Another 40-point triple-double <laughs> last night. He does things on the basketball court that appear to be simple, but they're really not. And I know you guys have played against him in the, in a, in the playoffs in a seven-game series. What do you see with Jokic? What it is about him that is so special? Man, he is just like... It's crazy because he's not by any means the athletic guy on the floor, you know, but he just knows his game. I think he's a player that just knows who he is on that court. And you put a small guy on him, he punishes him. You know, somebody his size, he uses his smarts and wits. Um, it's just, it's, it's a tough matchup. And it's it's one that we failed to figure out so far. Um but it, it was blown. I was blown away because I have quick hands and like some of the, you know, passes that they were throwing to him, they were kind of out of his range. But the way that he could tip it and get it back to himself, um, those are usually steals, you know, on anybody else. I, if if that ball is thrown outside of your area, I'm getting it. And the way that he can just quick tip it and get it right back and go right up with it. And, you know, he gets up you know, pretty quick for a guy that's not athletic. Like his second jump, he's right back on the play. Um, so he's just a tough cover. And like, we we tried everything from switching to putting myself, Kawhi on him to having Mace guard him. Like it was, you know, we we had no answer for him yesterday. I, in watching the game, obviously Mason guarded him quite a bit, but at times uh, Nico was on him. You guarded him, Kawhi guarded him. And so, a lot of the strategy was around fronting, and that was uh, something I noticed as well on those lob passes over the top. And you guys got a couple of them that were sort of underthrown, but the lob mm -hmm. passes over the top, it, it you know, with your guys' length, it seemed like uh, you were going to get the basketball, and he's just able to sort of corral everything within his space. That, Dwight was way more athletic than him, but the player that I relate that to because I played with Dwight was just mm -hmm. his ability to grab a basketball that was outside of everyone else's space. Like the normal amount of space that a player can cover and get a basketball, Dwight was as good as anyone is getting something outside of his, his space. And Jokic does that. The other thing I loved at the end of the game, um, so obviously Murray has the basketball and you guys put Kawhi on him. Uh, mm -hmm. You were guarding Jamal and they were running up another pick and roll. So a lot of times it was Eric Gordon's guy late game to get mm -hmm. the first switch. And then they'd run the second pick and roll with Jokic to get Eric Gordon on him. And it's that mm -hmm. like game of chess at the end of the game that I find so interesting, the manipulation of matchups and everybody does it, but that's the part of the game to me right now that is, is like really exciting. Yeah. I mean, because you know, like you said, it's it's chess. And so, like, we were doing it on our end. You know, we found, like, if Murray or KCP was going to guard me and Gordon was going to be on Kawhi, well, then I'll set the screen, put Kawhi on the block with a smaller player on him, like, you know, KCP or Jamal Murray or, or Bruce Brown. Like, like, we'll go at him that way as well. But it's just, you know, it's, it's what the game turned into, especially with a bunch of guys or a bunch of teams that are going towards the switching lineups um because it's just so hard like it's it's hard to be in coverage with with the way the game is played now and how well teams shoot you try to keep uh out of you know rotations as much as possible and so like yeah you know uh what what coach malone did over there was smart trying to get eg into the action to free up you know 
because uh, uh, we know where the ball is going. We know what's going to happen. And he's so good in the middle of the floor. You know, I think that's why it's so tough with Philly as well. You put Joel Embiid in the middle yep. of the floor, and now you can't double or you can't, you know, he can see all of that. You know, right. when I mean? he's facing at the elbow and, or facing at the at the at the foul line, it's, yeah. it's impossible and to bring no, a double. Yeah, no double. You can't double from right there, and so it's just you're at his mercy at that point. What was your first uh, impression of uh, Jokic? You first met him. So Jokic, when I first met him, he was fat, like he's skinnier. <laughs> So I'm like, wait. And then I remember like, well, the first time I met him, he came to the gym when I when I first got to Denver. He came and rebound for me for a little bit. I was like, oh, he's a he's a good guy. But he I didn't really know too much about him because I didn't ever watch the Nuggets. And he wasn't, he was good. He wasn't as good as he is now. And then we went, ended up going to training camp and I'm watching him play. And he's doing all right, but like Mason Plumley was doing just as good as a Joker. And I'm like, wait, so why does Joker start over Mason Plumley? And then I remember my teammates just saying, like, no, like, when he wants to, he can score 40 a night. If he didn't just pass and he just wanted to score, I was like, no way, bro. They were like, wait till the season starts. And so we, I waited, and, like, I've never seen anything like him. Just the way he just – it's just weird. Like, he's just a weird dude. He'll just – before the game, he's on his little phone playing games, you know. I think he's starting to take his, his health more serious. But, like, before that, I heard – after the season, he just goes back, drinks beer, rides horses, and then tries to get in shape a couple weeks before the season starts. Like he's just naturally and like amazing. I don't know. JJ, does that sound from, like somebody you know? I'm not. I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, man. <laughs> Fuck you, Tommy. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I I have seen, by the way, the Nuggets are putting out some amazing Jokic hype video workouts the dude looks in shape he's gonna have another exactly. big season wait, wait, like mike do you know have you have you have you interacted with his brothers man his brothers are like mobsters bro like they <laughs> they're so different than him like he got some but they're like they're, they really like they'll come out on the court and try to fight like almost every other game and they're like i guess they're a big deal back in serbia but they're just like they're so different than joker but they they take care of them they're cool guys I have a I have a sort of question, like in in terms of how you would sort of describe him, like as a guy, as like a teammate, because you know, as good as he is, right, MVP, all that stuff, like as good as he is, like there's just it, there seems to be this shroud of mystery about his personality. Like he'll he'll provide some unintentional comedy, he'll provide some funny quips in in interviews, but what is he what is he like as a teammate? Yeah, I mean, I think he's one of those leaders who doesn't necessarily lead by being vocal all the time. He's just going to lead more by example. Um, and he's starting to take that more serious. I think before he was just a star without necessarily really wanting to be a star. Now he's like, okay, I know how good I am. I know I'm the MVP. Let me help bring these dudes along with me. So the most that I get from Joker is like his consistency, taking care of his body, being in the training room. He's available every game. He, you know, he has his small circle that he sticks to, his brothers. But, I mean, as far as personality, I mean, the dude is just, he's, like, we have some deep conversations sometimes, and I respect his mentality so much because he's more just like, almost like Giannis. Just like, take it day by day, game by game. Even if I have a bad game, I'm going to be the same dude. I really don't care that much. If I have a great game, I'm not going to get arrogant. Like, I'm going to be the same dude. Like, so that's what I respect about Joker the most because he just is, he doesn't even view himself as like a superstar. Have you been on the court? We talk about this with, uh, with Luca a lot. And then Giannis as well, when we just had Drew on, where like sometimes they will make plays that every other NBA player on the court is like, what the fuck just happened? Like Luca does it like every like five games. So hit some shot. And everyone's like, I can't believe he just hit that. Has there ever been like a pass or anything like that where you're like, yo, I can't believe that this dude just did that? It's more like as the game goes on and it's down the wire, how he just doesn't change. His emotion doesn't change. He just he hit a buzzer beater. He really doesn't care. Like he never is sped up. Everything is just his game. Like that's the most impressive thing about him. He'll make a buzzer beater or a big shot down the stretch. And it's just like, it's just like it was the first quarter. You know what I mean? He doesn't really feel pressure. I feel um, we had a we had a very brief conversation when um, when we were teammates about 
European or overseas superstars versus American superstars. And I thought, I, I don't remember your exact comment, but I thought it was really interesting. And one of the, just like the takeaways was the European superstars, a lot of them, and we can talk about Giannis, you, um, Jokic, for instance, it seems like they're a little more low maintenance than some other ones. And we can point to American superstars like Steph who are very low maintenance. Um, but culturally, why, why do you think that is? Hmm. I don't know. Are you talking only about basketball players? Because, you know, they're you're an, you're European superstars like Ronaldo, which is... Uh, <laughs> it's, I, I was mostly yeah. speaking about basketball players. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean... You know, Jokic don't have Instagram or nothing. <laughs> He's just a different guy. He loves his horses. I tried to convince him to to make Instagram, but he said, no, no chance, no chance. And I don't know, man. But I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, no. But now, with all these Instagrams, Twitter, TikToks, you can make a lot of money. And with the sponsorships, uh, they want you to post things, you know. It just different role right now than than it was yeah i'm, I'm sure after that 205 million dollar extension you saw and you need those those instagram <laughs> sponsors <laughs> yeah as much as as much as possible man what what is what is your game what does your game look like in five years how do you how do you sort of uh visualize your growth as a player over the next three to five years you know, uh, you know, one of my favorite players to watch is Jokic um, because of how patient he is. And, and that's more so not to say I want to be a Jokic, but I want to I want to play with that patience. And that's what I want my game to sort of feel like and, and have that, that vibe, that patience, that understanding, seeing things before it happens, you know, reading the game at a high level. That's that's what I want. I feel like, as I said, the game naturally, I can play the game naturally, go out there and just run around and dunk and make an open shot and you know, find the ball, you know, instincts, all that stuff is great. But, you know, I want to be a basketball genius. I want to understand the game. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's what I want, you know, whatever it looks like, I, but I want that. I want to, I want to be able to make all the right reads all the time um, and, and, and help my win, help my team win in that way. You get, you get to Denver. What are your first impress impressions of Nicole Jokic? <laughs> He's one of, like I I I didn't like so before I got there I didn't I didn't have no impression on or try to think like how he is I was just like okay let me let me just go see how he is in person and when I first seen him I'm like bro it don't even feel real like I like this is how Yoke act like you know coming off of uh being an MVP um so like dang like this this guy's very humble like he doesn't want to talk about no accolades like it's just straight work and. It ain't nothing else. Like he just, he, it's all about team and winning and everything else. All the accolades is just like, it's not, I'm not saying like he don't care about it, but he don't speak about it. He don't want to talk about it. Like it's just, okay, just throw it to the side. I just want to win a championship and just, and multiple championships. That's really just his day to day approach. And I'm like, man, like just to have a teammate like that. And like, man, cause that's, that's something that I, that's a dream of mine. I, I want to accomplish that as well too. So just to see that from him, like, man, like that's a very humble guy. I'm a humble guy myself. So just look at yoga, like, man, you, you don't, you, you want somebody like that leading your franchise, you know? And, and like, man, like you can look at yoke and be like, man, yoke, yoke doing it. Yoke a back to back MVP. You know, he's a, but he's a very humble guy. And that's something that's, that's something that a kid can look up to. Yeah. I, I, I would argue that he is Tommy, the most unassuming NBA superstar potentially of all time like i would probably throw tim duncan in that yeah, in yeah, that yeah, as well yeah. uh, uh timmy was like that uh, so i did y'all's game a couple weeks ago in denver against the lakers yeah and i uh went with the espn crew to stk afterwards yeah and and the the staff was like oh Jokic is coming in tonight Jokic is coming in so mm -hmm. he rolls in with his brothers of course and yeah. he comes over and says hi to our table comes over to me and he's like he's like yo he's like yo I, I didn't even know you were doing espn you know i'm not on social media yeah. I, don't, I don't really know anything that's awesome he's like i yeah. know you have the podcast 
And I had to, I had to shoot my shot. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm like, you're welcome on the show every, anytime, anytime. I know you probably would never do it. And he's like, yeah, you're right. I'd never do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's really him, yo. He don't want to do anything regarding no thing that's going to be on social media. Man. He does not have zero. He has zero interest in that. He Think about this. Go. Think about this. This guy's won two MVPs. I just looked it up today. He's number yeah. one every advanced, almost every advanced stat. Like so, <laughs> yeah. Raptor five thirty eight's advanced stat, like all encompassing yep. advanced stat. He's number one in the league again this year. Yep. This dude is like the best or one of the best NBA <laughs> players in the world. And all we know about him is that he likes horses. Like that's that all, all we know about him. You don't know anything. I'm his, I'm his teammate. I, that's all I know. <laughs> I'm his teammate, bro. That's all I know is that he likes horses. You know, he's just on his phone and he's watching horses all day. Like, it's really all you will know about him. Like, his private life, you won't know. Like, nothing. Like, and I, I was recently just on a flight with his his wife. And I'm like, wait, that's Yoke's wife. And I was I was kind of, I was under weather, so I didn't want to go over there. She had a baby. I didn't want to, you know, go over there and talk to, to them and get something to them. You know, they have, a like, a newborn. So I'm like, man, this is, you know, they come back on a flight. Like, just to, just to see how, you know, um, private they are. That's something that you like you will look forward to or look up to as well to just see how off the grid they are, you know? Was was there a particular play, maybe a pass or something like that when you first got to Denver, uh, where you're like, Oh yeah, this dude is just different? Yeah, the one in uh um I think it was against the Spurs. Uh it was a pick and roll play, came off, they hit him in the pocket. No, they 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 lost the ball over. He knew the guy was coming over and just smacked it. He didn't even look at AG. He just smacked it and he didn't even look at him. AG caught it and just dunked it. I'm like, bro, like, how did you know he was just there and you just tipped the ball like it was a volleyball? But that was like one of the craziest pads I ever seen in my life. He didn't even look at it. It's literally like he lost it and he just tapped it and it went to AG and he banged it. I'm like, man, that's just insane, bro. <laughs> Crazy. He has he has some crazy highlight passes, but there is something. Uh, uh, maybe you'll agree with me. Maybe you'll push back. There's something that's very ho hum about his game, partially because mm -hmm. of just how he moves. You know, yeah, he, he yeah, just yeah. kind of moves at his own speed and his own cadence. Um, but I get into an argument all the time with my eight year old son Knox because we'll ask him, you know, who's your favorite players, and he'll say Steph, Luca, yeah, and and uh, <laughs> one day he said to me. You know who's my least favorite player is? And I was like, no, who's like Jokic? <laughs> like, Jokic? Uh, why? Why is Jokic your least favorite player? And he says, well, he doesn't have any good YouTube highlights. That's what he told me. And I'm like, I, what YouTube highlights are you watching, bro? Because the game I was doing against y'all, he had this ridiculous one legged step back from the top of the key. Yes, I was yep. just like, that's sick. That's sick. That's like, a highlight. I think it's because it's not so flashy. It's not yeah. like, he got a real old school slow game, like a lot of people, uh, and that's why I feel like he don't get a lot of press in the NBA because, like, I feel like they think, oh, it's not going to bring back revenue or or it's not going to bring back this, and you know, so I feel like they don't cover him as much just to, just the fact on like he's not an exciting player. But when you when you really watch him, where he's doing some exciting things, though, you just really have to watch the game, you know. So yeah, I don't know. I, I well, I I think that brings up a good point, and and I there's an element not only for casual NBA fans, but there's an element for even Twitter diehards uh, yeah. where I think we sort of take him for granted. As a teammate, night to night, do you ever find yourself taking what he does for granted? Um, nah, not at all. Uh, like, I take pages out of his book as far as routine and trying to, like, like, because last year I was struggling as far as, like, trying to figure out a routine and, and understand, like, this is a long season. You have to have a routine in the NBA. You just can't just go with the flow and try to, like, figure it out at, on, on the way. That You will get lost in the sauce. And I was finding myself lost for, like, five, six games. I'm like, man, like, I got to figure out a routine. And one game after one game, I'm like, man, like, I, I just literally just watched Yoke. And I'm like, man, let me see what he does. You know, so he, he, just, he just did his whole routine, whether it's a win or a loss. I'm like, man, like, that's really allowing him to, you know, uh, prevent poor performance, you know, whether we lose or or we win, like he's literally preventing poor performance due to a routine and following that routine every day and being disciplined to, to and understanding like, man, like I had to do this routine to, you know, prevent injury or prevent this, prevent that. So I, I follow his routine, not, not like follow his, but like 
I follow like, man, I got to get my own routine and figure out what works for me. And I found it. And I'm like, man, I start to see my game just elevate and rise. So that's something that I definitely took a page out of your book for sure. Michael Malone said he never fights the game. And I thought that was one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of Jokic. Whatever is needed on a possession, he's just going to make the right play. He doesn't go in with agenda. Sometimes he's happy shooting 10 times and getting 15 assists. Sometimes, like last night, he knows he's got to score a little bit. So he had 40, 17, and 10 in overtime. Uh, this stat will never get old to me. The Nuggets are 23-0 and this season when he records a triple-double. And going back to last year, they've won 27 straight games when he has a triple-double. There's been so many guys who get accused of stat padding. Look, Westbrook's MVP season, like, I'm not accusing Westbrook. That wasn't stat padding. The Oklahoma City Thunder needed him to average yeah. triple-double for them to be a six seed and make the playoffs. I'm not saying Westbrook was stat padding that year. But there are times where certain guys stat pad. That's just the NBA. He doesn't. He just plays, and it benefits the team. It benefits everybody. That's his third 40, 15, and 10 game this season, the most in a single season in NBA history. And watching him play is, I don't want to hyperbolize this, but it is a spiritual experience. <laughs> JJ, can you explain uh, Jokic for a second? Can you explain what makes him so dominant? Yeah, I'd be, he doesn't really have any weaknesses in his game. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Um, because he's so big and such a great passer and such a willing passer. Because it's not about just about being able to make the pass. He's such a willing passer that the threat of his pass puts you in a conundrum. Uh, and then, of course, he can score on ISO. He can score on closeouts. He can score on pick and pop. Um, you know, he can handle the ball. Like I, to me, I, I mean, I I don't want to speak anything bad about Joel because he's our guy. <laughs> you know, he's he's one of my closest friends in the NBA. But I, I have a hard time saying that anyone should win MVP but him. I think he should be yeah. the MVP this year. Kenny, what do you think? What makes it even better is that he had this rep of being like a bad defender, but he's not, you know, he's just not a bad defender anymore. Um, he He's the runaway MVP. Um, you can make cases for other guys, but I don't think any case is as good as Nikola Jokic is this year, especially since he's like tacking on it. He had like 22 in the first half against the Knicks tonight and they were up by 20 against the, the red hot Knicks. Um, and Jamal Murray goes down and they go what nine, nine and oh, it's like, I, yeah, think nine, I think nine and one. I think they, nine they went on a nine and one streak until they had lost to the Lakers the other night. They were on a nine and one streak. Yeah, yeah defensively, insane. people don't realize how good his hands are. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> the tendency for a big like him, because he's not the quickest guy, right, is just to put him way back in pick and roll coverage. And and basically, we, we talk about drop coverage all the time on the podcast, but the tendency is for a guy like him, you put him way back in the pick and roll coverage, you drop him like you do with Gobert um, or Brooke Lopez or whoever, um, but he's actually up in pick and roll coverage. And it's almost like a, it's a game of peekaboo a little bit where when he jumps out at the ball handler, he's so good with his hands that he makes you change direction. And a lot of times he actually gets his his hand on the ball and he, he, you know, he gets a deflection or he gets a steal. Um, again, Tommy, to your, to, to, to your question, I should also say this, like this goes without saying, but it should be said about every great player, whether it's Kyrie or Rudy Gobert or Giannis, whatever their skill set is, what makes a great player great is their mind. And Jokic is an incredibly smart player on both ends of the floor. What's going through your head when he hit some of those those moon ball shots? I don't even know how to describe what they are at the end of the shot clock. Yeah, man. He, I mean, I think he hit two or three this year. I think, and we we talk about it after the game. He doesn't. He doesn't really. He's like, I didn't even aim. I just threw it up in the air. <laughs> I, I think that he just his touch and his just awareness is just kind of like, it's just there without him really having to try it. So in those in the shot clock situation, he just throws it up in the general vicinity of the rim and it goes in sometimes like KCP says like for him, his hands are quicker than his eyes. Like he gets a lot of 
You know, he strips the ball a lot. I think Nikola, his touch is just like, it's just there. He doesn't even have to think about it. So, yeah, when those shots went through, I was just, you know, it's, <laughs> all you can do is smile, man. And then seeing like AD's reaction, you know, LeBron's reaction, it's just, it's funny because that dude is, is for sure one of a kind. It feels like with him, his ability to anticipate the play before the play before the play, it's like, it's like a beautiful mind. It, it, the way he sees things materialize, the way he baits, it, it, it's like he's toying with the game. He's playing a different game than everyone else. And playing with him for, you know, now a few seasons, it, it kind of rubs off on you. So I kind of can understand what he's thinking, where he kind of wants guys at, you know, a pass that no one else would think is coming to me. I kind of already know Nicola is kind of looking that way, even if he's not even – even if he's looking the complete other way. So it's really, it's strange, man. It, like he's a strange dude because he, when I first came in the league, he wasn't the worker he is now. You know, he's super consistent in his work ethic now, but it just so much of it seems so natural. His touch and his, you know, passing ability and those type of things. It just seems so unforced and just part of, him, it's 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 pretty crazy, man. It really is. I was Mike. I was always curious about this. I don't think we talked about this before. Him in practice, you know, like when we when we talk to Luca or Steph or some of the other guys who are sort of similar in terms of the crazy things they do in the court. There's always a certain level of okay, they do this during a game, but in practice they do shit that's even crazier that no one ever sees. Does he do that, or is there, or is it just kind of like this is in the moment and it is, you know, he's just sort of normal during practice. No, like he's not as good in practice. Like <laughs> when I when I first when I first got drafted, I remember him and Mason Plumley would go up against each other. And you know, Mason Plumley likes to dunk. He likes to he's a little bit more athletic. So I was like, wait, why does why does Nicola start over Mason? Like, I don't get it. Like all training camp, I couldn't, I couldn't and then all my team was just like, just wait, like you'll see in the games, like he could score fifty every night if he wanted to. He doesn't always do it, but he could if he wanted to. And then you actually see uh, the real games and it just it just happens bro like he does some he does some crazy stuff in practice but you know the game's completely different so basically what you're saying is Dakota treats practice like the all-star game yeah exactly exactly that's exactly <laughs> how he treats it. Oh, is it is it gratifying for you as the first European player to win rookie of the year to see all these guys, whether it's Luka, yeah. Giannis, like how how much of a takeover there's been, even in the last five years. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been great to see how you know how all the European and international players have just uh, established themselves uh, in the, not just in the league, but as some of the top players in the league. I mean, you say Luka, uh, Jokic, uh, Giannis. I mean, they, we're talking about three. I think uh, this is they're in the top ten in the league. Top 10 players, I, I don't think you can get them out of the top 10, neither of those players. And, you know, obviously Giannis and, and Jokic have won MVPs the last uh, the last three years. That's where the MVPs have been, you know, European players, which is something quite extraordinary as well. So just, just very proud of where the international game has gotten to, how the European players now, they see this as a, you know, a real possibility. It's not just making it. It's not becoming just an all-star, not just winning a championship. It's it's like being one of the best players in the league and year in, year in, year out. Uh, I mean, that's pretty pretty remarkable, and I just hope it continues. Um, and the NBA has done a great job. I mean, really extending the game and, and making the game a global game and establishing academies and uh, all over the world and the Basketball Without Border programs. They've done a great work, great work. Um uh, doing that um, but yeah I think it all started kind of a little bit with that 92 team where inspired a generation like like my generation uh, and made the game bringing that first pro professional team of uh, internationally in the Olympic Games Barcelona which happens to be my city um, you know it's, it, it changed the game speaking of taking it for granted and JJ I'm curious your opinion on this too just for the fans listening, as shooters, as a shooter who plays with him, as a shooter who plays with a lot of good passing bigs, can you explain how how his game optimizes the skill set of shooters in a particular way? Because I do feel like it's something you guys in particular might notice rather than sort of people who are not taking advantage of it as much. Um, I feel like, so you're saying like 
like reword it for me because I'm- well, just I mean, he's such an he's such an incredible passer, and yeah. like like Luke is like this. LeBron's like he's such an incredible passer that that he he has the ability to create open looks in a way that you know other guys might oh, not be able yeah, to. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Um, just the fact that he just generates so much attention on the, on the court, like I feel like. If you in the corner, you know, like if he gets the ball in, in, in a certain spot on the floor, you know the pass is coming. Like, like he just, he just whip it to the corner out of nowhere, but you just you like you know to have your hand ready. So just playing with a guy like that that can make those passes, I feel like a, a average, like not even an average NBA player, because it's, it's, it's superstars in the NBA right now that can't make those passes, and you'll be in the corner wide open. So that's something that I don't take for granted. Just playing with Yoke, because like he's literally finding you, you know when. You know, a lot of other guys, like in the league, if you're playing with somebody else, they won't find you being in the corner, deep corner, like like that. Like, it's, it's just so much attention that he's generating. Like, you have to be ready to, you know, knock down a shot. And I feel like you can get easily eight to ten points just be, by being in the game, you know, for that little spurt of time with him. Just just, just being in the game with him and just being ready to shoot the ball. So that's, that's something that I don't take for granted, uh, you know, playing on, on, a, on a team with Yoke. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's the timing of the passes. Like, he's never, mm-hmm. a, he's never a beat late. And mm-hmm. he can sort of anticipate that help defender leaning the wrong way. So his yes, movement's coming yeah. into the paint. <laughs> and as soon as he sees that, the ball's on a, a, a zip line right to you, uh, yep. you know, on time, on target, right? That's, that's, those are the best passes if you're a shooter, on time, on target. Yep. Actually, in 2019, when I was a free agent, it became sort of clear that Philly was not going to give me a real contract offer. And so I was sort of looking at other options and mm-hmm. Denver was an option. It was for yeah. the full mid level uh on a two year deal. And I, I really wanted a third year. <laughs> and, yeah. But like that was a that was the reason. I mean, I was like, I could go play with Jokic. And it, for me, <laughs> somebody who moves without the ball yeah. and cut and cuts a lot, or I did cut a lot. I can't cut anymore, but <laughs> I did cut a lot. <laughs> like I just envisioned like, oh, I'm gonna get two wide open threes yep. and two layups every game yep. without even having to like create. Dude, I just got to, I just got to move <laughs> at all. And I feel like, you know, just like on that aspect where I said, like, it's you literally get eight to 10 points just be being in a game with him just in literally a four minute spurt. Like you literally could get eight to 10 points just by just being ready, uh, moving without the ball, you know, cutting, setting the screen for him. And then, you know, roll into the basket. He just dying you easy. He had a wild layup. So, I just just playing with him and and understanding how he plays and and also like generate my own flair, you know. In that, I'm like, dang man, I like you definitely got something for sure. Like as far as the team, like man, you got something. Like it's, it's just so much dynamic scores and also a guy like Yoke that can pass like that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely trouble. Let me say something real quick. Let me just say something. Nikola Jokic is the best player in the world right now. If you don't believe that, I will respectfully disagree with you. There's no shade. There's no hate. You're allowed to disagree with that statement. He's the best player in the world right now. He's on a historic playoff run. There's not really an answer. I, you know, supposed to talk about this today on first take, and uh, unfortunately, Doc Rivers uh, was fired. And so the breaking news, you know, kind of took us off our script a little bit. But I was going to go through some of the the top playoff performances so far in the playoffs. Think about this. Game five against the Phoenix... No, I'm sorry. Game four against the Phoenix Suns. Uh, They lose. Denver loses. Jokic has 53 and 11. And a lot of that was one-on-one. They make a little bit of an adjustment where they're just like, we're going to go back to having Jokic high, having him hit cutters, having him play DHO action. He goes for a 29-point triple-double in Game 5. He goes for a 32-point triple-double in Game 6 to close him out. And then tonight, he's got 34, 21, and 14 on 12 of 17 from the field. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It's it's, It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And this is going against Anthony Davis. I, I want to just touch on something that you hit on, which was uh, Nicola's ability to just sort of figure it out. And I said recently he has a supercomputer in his brain um, in the same way that LeBron has a supercomputer in his brain. Um, and, and at this point in his career, he's seen every defense and every coverage 
Um, and it's just, it, he's really just one of the most fascinating players. I know last time on the podcast, you talked a lot about, about him. Um, but my question for you is related to this season where you guys are, I think it was 42 and 19 or 46, something like that. You guys had essentially locked up first place. And then for like, I guess it was 46, 19, you guys for, had locked up first place. And then for like 17 games towards the end of the season, <clears throat> didn't play a lot of guys. Had, a, had some three or four game losing streaks. It felt like a lot of people were sleeping on you. Um, the first take debacle happened. Um, did, did Nicola talk about that at all? Like, I know he's not concerned with the MVP. I know that's not where he places his priorities or his focus. Um, but how much did all of that MVP noise, and it wasn't just the first take thing. It just, the, the, it seemed like the MVP discussion and discourse took on this entire life of its own for whatever reason this season. Yeah, I could genuinely say, and I don't know if there's another basketball player in the NBA that would be so nonchalant about that type of stuff as Nicola, but I can genuinely say like he didn't he didn't care. He was more he was more nonchalant about it than I think uh like anyone could have could really understand if you were that he really did not care if he won the MVP. He didn't care about any of that. Um we definitely had we definitely had, uh, like you said, a three or four game losing streaks at the end of the season. But, you know, the, the end of the regular season can kind of become a drag. Um, we we actually talked about it, though, because if we had won a couple of those games, we would add home court advantage for sure against, you know, if we had played Philly in the finals or against Boston. Um, we would have it still against the Heat. But those those last games do matter. But we just – we were ready to get to the playoffs. Um, but all the noise outside about, you know, the Nuggets are struggling towards the end of the season. Are they going to, you know, bring it in the playoffs or the MVP debate? We got a team full of people that don't even care about that stuff. Like it doesn't even come up in the locker room. So I feel pretty fortunate to be on a team like that because it just, we're, it's just an unselfish team. Nicola doesn't care about individual accolades at all. We're all after one goal, which is a championship. And it's just cool how selfless he is. That's that's one character trait of his that I can genuinely say is like, is, is pretty amazing. It's how selfless he is and how those things don't drive him at all, the individual accolades. The league does try to copycat. Steph, James Harden, Dame, those are the three guys that I think really changed the paradigm about how we think about three-point shooting and volume three-point shooting, specifically with guys that can generate 10 or 12 threes a game. In terms of how that relates to Jokic, he seems like such an anomaly to me. Um, and I used the comparison today with let's talk about the skill set in a second, but let's I use the comparison today. He reminds me a lot of Steph and he reminds me a lot of Tim Duncan in that they're low maintenance, selfless superstars. The culture is very easy to build when your superstar is wired that way always wanting to deflect credit, always wanting to deflect attention. You see him light up when he talks about his teammates. You see him uncomfortable when he talks about himself. I don't know that that's replicable. Now, the, the one thing I'll say that is, I'm a firm believer that the best way to build a roster is through the draft. And you can make timely acquisitions through free agency or through trades. I think they, they bought... Aaron Gordon, super low from the Orlando Magic, and he's turned out to be a perfect fit for them. But ultimately, if there's anything to copy from the Nuggets, if there's anything to copy from Golden State, if there's anything to copy from the way that the Memphis Grizzlies have rebuilt following the grit and grind era, to me, it's you've got to be able to build through the draft. You've got to be able to find rotation level players late in the draft, or even in the case of the Miami Heat, undrafted players. So I'm so glad he brought up the character of Nikola Jokic because I do believe um, his ethos, his spirit uh, sort of permeates the roster. And we did a game with him this year. He set some sort of passing record. Forgive me for not re re recollecting what it was. It was, I think, back in January. And I can't remember who it was, Roz or Cassidy, who did the post-game interview. But you know, Nikola, his responses to those are um, – you know, whatever he's he's going to talk in generalities, not not out of um, you know shortness or disrespect or anything like that. It's more just discomfort with talking about himself. But the question had to do with passing, 
And he said something along the lines of, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but the line was something like, you know what, I am proud that my passing elevates my teammates. That does make me happy. And he has just got to be so much fun to play with. And one thing that struck me this morning in the interviews we did, both with Miami and with Denver, so we talked to Gabe Vincent and we talked to Aaron Gordon, and they both said the same thing um, in different ways. And it was talking about Nicola. Obviously, we know Denver's numbers in the regular season, how porous they were at the rim. Nicola's individual defense, which I think is underrated. I'm not telling you athletically this is Vince Carter, but both guys, here's what Gabe Vincent said. And I would liken it to what KD said about Luka Jic. Gabe Vincent said of uh, Nicola, he surprises you because you think he's lumbering and all of a sudden he hits you with a burst and he's passed you or he's done something that's taken you by surprise. Um, And the way Aaron Gordon said it was a little bit more direct. Uh, You know, he's got a little bit more mobility than you think. Got certainly more strength than people are probably accustomed to having. Um, I don't know if he's Stephen Adams strong. That that guy, good luck moving him. Just, I don't know, Jay. I, I... I feel, and you tell me if I'm incorrect, JJ, I just feel like the disrespect continues in some ways for this guy. I can't stand the the the, the descriptions of him. We, we are watching greatness. We are watching greatness. We are watching things happening that we've not seen before. 30, 20, and 10 in, in what a sense was a must, must win game. Am I perceiving uh, uh, what's out there about Nikola Jokic to this point? I don't think you're misperceiving. Number one, he's having an historical playoff run. And I would also say Jamal Murray's playoff run this year, just on a production level, Mm. is on par with a number of Steph's playoff runs. And I'm not saying Jamal, like Steph is in a different stratosphere in terms of his resume. I'm not saying that at all. But in terms of the run itself, and look, they've they've beaten a two-time or three-time defensive player of the year in Rudy Gobert. They've beaten one of the rising young stars in Anthony Edwards. They've beaten Devin Booker on an all-time burner. They've beaten Kevin Durant. They've beaten LeBron and Anthony Davis. Yeah. They're going against the tough Miami Heat team and Jimmy Butler and one of the all-time greatest coaches in Eric Spolstra. Let's not diminish at all what they're accomplishing right now. Mm. Um, I saw this great clip because I, I wanted to bring this up at some point on the podcast. And, uh, and I'll make sure our social team links this out. But I came across this great clip uh, earlier in the week um, from Tom Haberstrow, who used to work at ESPN. Yeah, of um, he, he's got a, a Basketball Illuminati podcast along with some other folks. And he did an interview with Marcus Elliott, who is the founder and runs P3, a performance training center in Santa Barbara. I've actually gone and done the testing at P3 as well. Um, and they were talking about how we need to rethink how we think about athleticism. We need to rethink athleticism, not just in terms of a vertical jump and a linear speed line to line, point A to point B. We need to think about how people move, how efficient they are, how they use their bodies, their mobility, all of these things. And Marcus actually said, we've tested Nicola, we've tested Luca. These guys are elite athletes, just not in the traditional sense of running and running really fast and jumping really high. Yeah. And the the thing that you brought up about the burst, I mean, if you watch him play specifically on that face cut that he makes yep. where he'll be at the top of the key or somewhere, you know, sort of hanging out at 17, 18 feet. And then he just, there's that quick burst face cut. If he gets the ball on that, he knows how to use his body. It's unstoppable. That's athleticism to me. That's not, look, he's not Vince Carter. You're right. But that is a form of athleticism. And he's an elite athlete to me. And I always tell people this that ask about Jokic. And I'm sure you have the same perspective. The whole thing with like TV adding weight, Nicola in person is slim and trim and in unbelievable shape. And for whatever reason, it doesn't appear that way. And I think to some degree, people struggle with that. You can't. His motor is unbelievable. His level of conditioning is off the charts. I mean, he started the fourth quarter now, right? Like, that's not typical last night. And Michael's like, our fourth quarters have been crap. And I'm not letting what happened in the first two fourth quarters of the series happen again. 
And and his staff at one point went to him in the fourth quarter, JJ and Tommy, and said, oh, we should lift Nicola. And he just looked at him like, hell no, I'm not lifting Nicola. And here's what you can't quantify in terms of like, um, you can't quantify how quickly Nicola uh, reads and feels, uh, you know, progressions and coverages and and all of those things. But I, I thought Aaron's point this morning about, you know, sort of his motor and the relentless, the relentless nature of what he does. I mean, you watch that guy run. I mean, he sprints an end to end to end to end to end and he doesn't wear out. And uh, and I just I don't know. He's I've enjoyed him for the entirety of his career. I tried to get him to do a, a, a film session next year. And I said, listen, I'm going to put you in a headlock like your brothers and I'm going to make you tap out if you say no. But he refused anyway. It's like, oh, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but I've told this story before on the pod, but I'll reiterate it here. I'll be brief. After a game this season in Denver, he showed up to the same restaurant that uh, RJ and I were at and we came over, said hello. And he's like, he's like, I knew you were doing TV. I didn't realize you were calling games. I'm sorry. I'm not on social media. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's all good. I said, listen, I know you'll never do it, but you have an open invite to the podcast. And he goes with a straight face. He's like, yeah, I'll never do it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, all right. That's my feel- ask. I'll never ask again. <laughs> You're making me feel better. Tommy, you just made me feel better. I'm not the only one getting rejected. <laughs> we've been, tr- we've been trying. We're, we're, st- we're still trying. I just, it's just one of those things. It's the great white whale that's never yeah. going to happen. And so you basically put it out of your mind. Yeah. And then if one day he wakes up and decides he wants to do it, I think for both of us, yeah. we'll, we'll walk in and be pleasantly surprised. ESPN I wanted to, to- better put us on a game together next year, JJ. You probably got more clout than I do at that, that place. They better put us. We're going to talk to Dave and Tim. We're going to talk to Dave and Tim. We're going to make this ha- happen. Look at these, look at these shooting lines. Jimmy Butler, five for eighteen. Gabe Vincent, three for thirteen. Max Struess, five for twelve. Lowry, four for thirteen. Bam, big first half. Quiet in the second half, nine for twenty. Jamal Murray, fantastic run in these playoffs, six for fifteen. Bruce Brown, four for fourteen. Michael Porter Jr., seven for seventeen. Aaron Gordon, one for six. Like nobody had it going. <laughs> and then you look at Jokic's shooting numbers in a closeout game to win the NBA championship where they're throwing everything at him. He goes 12 for 16. Just a ho-hum 12 for 16. The guy's literally on another planet right now. Um, We will discuss. I'm sure we will do it on the podcast uh, in a reasonable way. I'm sure I will be broached with the topic on first take throughout the next couple weeks. Where does Jokic stand all time? Where does this playoff run stand all time? Look, he has cemented himself as an all-time great. That's a fact. Multiple MVPs, a finals MVP, a championship. He's eight years in. He's entering his prime. There's no reason to think that they're the, the Nuggets are, are, are not going to have multiple deep playoff runs. Will, will they win another championship? I don't know. But this team with this core, given their age, I think they, they have a chance to be in title contention, whatever that looks like. Deep playoff runs for a long time. Even without all that, Jokic is an all-timer. Is he top 20? Is he top 30? I don't know. I don't care. We'll, we'll discuss. The instant reaction, though, for, from my standpoint, he's an all-timer. He's an all-time great. Crazy that he was left off the top 75 list. Is Oh, man. Anyways, apparently stat padding gets you a long way in the NBA. It gets you all the way to the championship if you're Nikola Jokic. Congrats to him.